we are letting too many people into our country. Just a few years ago, news stories like these filled America's television screens. Immigration is not an entitlement. It's a privilege. America must take care of America first. Today, the U.S. government has renewed its commitment to defend its southern border. And it's costing American taxpayers billions of dollars. Is it working? We traveled from California to Laredo, Texas, to explore the conflicts that continue to plague the American border. Ed and Donna Tisdale used to live in peace and quiet here on their ranch east of San Diego. What goes on out here, what goes on in Washington is a whole different ballgame. Just past that high tower line, that's Mexico. And where those pine trees are on the hill, that is the border. They say their property has become a freeway for drug smugglers and illegal border crossers. The last two or three days, we've had 30, 40 people through here. 40,000 people came through my ranch. How many people came across in the other 2,000 some miles? All they want to do is get from point A to point B and they don't give a damn what they mess up in between. Radios, they carry uh, night vision. I'd like to own a set of goggles like that myself, you know? So yeah, I'd, I'd say they got some pretty high tech stuff going. We just started taking film of um, what was going on and this is a tape of the illegals. They came through here every morning uh, for months and months. For residents, the pain and frustration of having one's land overrun by illegal aliens is still fresh. And when you try and call law enforcement and it takes 45 minutes or three days to get a response, you know, it's, it's a problem. So our questions to the law enforcement agencies are, you know, what are we supposed to do? How do we, are we supposed to defend ourselves? Are we just supposed to let them, you know, run over and take control of our property? And the basic answer was, yeah. But as frustrated as they are, the situation is changing along the American border. That's because the federal government has taken billions of dollars and aimed it right at the heart of the problem. Some right there. Arriba. Over the past five years, the INS budget has nearly tripled to $3.8 billion. Lots of the money has gone here. This is what's called a port of entry. It's the border crossing at San Ysidro, California, just south of San Diego. It's ground zero for Operation Gatekeeper, a government plan to crack down on illegal immigration and the drug trade along the southwest border. There you go. Operation Gatekeeper is a joint effort of the INS, U.S. Customs, and the National Guard. It's a plan designed to pour resources into the San Diego border area, stepping up searches like these. Why don't we have marijuana in the back seat on this one? Okay. Oscar Preciado is the director of the San Ysidro Port of Entry. Some inspectors will look at certain vehicles because they've had, they found drugs in those vehicles or they know the compartments. Customs inspectors pulled over this car after a canine detected hidden narcotics. They use a lot of times um, air fresheners to make disguise the different smells that are in the car from the marijuana. Unable to pry open the backseat compartment, inspectors suspect that smugglers created an electronic locking device to hide the marijuana. They have like door hinges on here. So you can try and put some sort of charge on those wires? Exactly. And they'll try and jump it open. The inspectors use jumper cables to short the car's electrical system and trip the lock. Just go ahead. There you go. Oh my God. It, it took us a few minutes to find the uh, switch, but they finally found it. Over 20 bundles of marijuana are discovered hidden behind the trap door. So does this get the blood pumping when you find something like this? It, it gets a good rush, uh, the inspectors. How much is that, do you think? I would say, what, 50 pounds? 100 pounds? There's more than that. Those are heavy packages. It's got to be a great feeling. It is, it is. Yeah. And they do this day in and day out. They do a great job here, great job. While custom stops contraband, the INS stops people from entering the U.S. illegally. Since Operation Gatekeeper began in 1994, the number of apprehensions in the San Diego region has come down dramatically. I think that the objective reality uh, in areas of the border that I personally visited is very different 
from what it was a few years ago. Michael Bromwich is the Inspector General for the U.S. Department of Justice. There are lots more Border Patrol agents along there. They are very visibly deployed. You can see their cars you know, strategically located along the way. And that's exactly what people who might be thinking of coming across the border see. We're, we're loving it. We, you know, we're ecstatic. Border Patrol agents like Robert Gilbert say that all you have to do is spend the day with them to see how much things have slowed down. Since Gatekeeper was initiated, through the resources, we've been able to take control and apprehensions have indicated such as they've gone down. I'm going to show you a couple videos about um, what used to happen here. This was the scene along the southern border during the late 1980s and early 1990s. Prior to October of 1994, as this video indicates here, uh, the border was completely out of control. It was a border in chaos. That's changed dramatically now and we've got control of the borders. But some San Diego residents like Bob Maupin disagree. The people that come across there are already breaking the law. They've broken into the country. Maupin says he's just a good American, upholding you, the law and defending his property from illegal border crossers. Out here in the eastern stretches of San Diego County, Maupin says Operation Gatekeeper isn't working. In my opinion, they don't want these people caught. If they did, they would do the things the way they used to and catch them. Our country's being invaded, and the invasion is aided and abetted by our government. While Maupin may be far from the halls of power, some in Washington are also saying that the INS isn't doing enough. We had the most porous borders of any industrialized country in the world. Lamar Smith is the Republican chair of the House Immigration Subcommittee. As far as illegal immigration goes, we continue to set records every day, every month, every year. While the tide of illegal crossings in San Diego appears to have slowed down, the reason for the crossings has not. Higher wages and money to be made from smuggling drugs are the main draw. Those coming across the border face gatekeepers' high-tech defenses, including planes, night vision goggles, and infrared scopes. While money and manpower are making a dent in illegal immigration in San Diego, the challenge now is to control the nearly 2,000 miles of rugged terrain along the rest of the southwest border. That takes the military and high-tech tools. That when we return. Okay, this is your the Border Patrol has been spending millions of dollars in taxpayers' money, and much of it goes into military high-tech tools. It all comes out of this right here. You just control it, just like you were playing a video game. You control that, and it spins it around, tilts it up and down, focuses it in on anything you want. Right there is this Bronco that we were just looking at right? with your camera. You can focus right in on them. You can almost read the decals on the truck. That is wild. The use of military hardware and troops on the border has been controversial. For many who live and work in border towns, things came to a head in 1997 when U.S. Marines shot and killed a Mexican-American teenager in Redford, Texas. The military says the 18-year-old Hernandez fired twice on the four-man unit, which was watching a stretch of the Rio Grande at Redford, Texas, for drug traffickers. Our friend and son went to the grave, and the Marines went to back to their activities, and uh, I think that should be, should be some kind of punishment. Soldiers are trained to do one particular thing, defend this country up to and including killing others to do so. Javier Becerra is the chair of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. Border Patrol officers are trained to kill if possible as well, but under different circumstances. We should not be sending military personnel to do the work of civilian police. Until we are at war with that neighboring country to the south, I don't see why we need to send our military. Incidents like the Redford shooting have some locals worried that militarizing the border may lead to another tragedy. Here in Hakumba, California, a tiny border town east of San Diego, residents are outspoken about the influx of Border Patrol agents in their area. As we are standing here at this moment, uh, there's a uh, uh, hundred guys hiding in the bushes out there somewhere looking for Mexicans. Bob Mitchell says that Hakumba is under siege. There are more law enforcement personnel in this hamlet per capita than in uh, Bosnia. Border Patrol is more invasive than the, than the Mexican people themselves. Geez, I bet 20 come in and 20 leave, you know. <laughs> there, there's not ever probably one 
Border Patrol agent that stays out here that long so they don't know the people that are around here. We don't want to be harassed by the Border Patrol either because we pay taxes out here. We pay their salary and they abuse their power. Mm -hmm. The store on the south side of the street is closed. They closed about uh, a month ago and the store on the east side of the street is for sale. Mm -hmm. And I, I really think their business is suffering because people aren't coming over and buying things like they used to. There has long been a symbiotic relationship between Hakumba and Hakume. <laughs> a Mexican village just over the border. It's important that the local people are allowed to cross and, and keep their community connected. Come on. Kirk Gellum is an American building contractor who has homes in both Hakumba and Hakume. This truck actually used to be in Hakume when I first came down here. We're in the back of Kirk's 1952 truck and uh, he's driving us over to the border to see if we can walk across and go to Hakume. I a lot of times walk through right here because I can, I don't have to even lift my legs. I just step right so there. So you just crossed into Mexico? Yeah, I did. And that's against the law, isn't it? I'm not sure. Where are you going? Uh, Smitty's in Mexico. Okay, we're going to slip through here. And now I'm entirely in Mexico. Yep. All right, international border incident right here. Yep. <laughs> does it feel different being in Mexico? Oh, yeah. It always does. It feels a little bit more rural. What's it say up here on this wall? Um, it has to do with going north and um, not to forget the people back home. Now what you're seeing here is America on the other side. We hiked over to Hakame. Here, Kirk introduced us to the local store owner. He's saying that before they put up the, the fences, you know, the, the Border Patrol was always there. They're there now and they're there before. But he's saying we're putting a wall up, whereas at the same time in Berlin they're tearing it down. And um, it's just such a contradiction. You can only stop people so much. If people are willing to cross an ocean or climb mountains to get here, a fence or a ditch is not going to stop them. We're always going to have people who yearn to be in the United States of America. 85 miles to the west of Hakame is Tijuana, Mexico. There, Jose Bravo, a local activist, took me to a place called Friendship Park. Friendship Park symbolizes the long-standing relationship between the U.S. and Mexico, but it was split in two with the construction of this fence. Here's the monument. See the monument right there? It's split in half. Now you only have half, half the friendship you had before. You, you know when you look through that you're not welcome there. That's right. At least some people aren't welcome there. Some people like? Some people like uh, immigrants of color. While Sammy was with Jose Bravo in Mexico, Lauren and I visited the American side of the same fence with Agent Gilbert. Down where the fence meets the Pacific Ocean, we came across a group of Mexican teenagers. Their interaction with Agent Gilbert was surprisingly friendly. There seemed to be a mutual understanding between the American agent and the people on the other side of the fence. Quiere sacar un, una foto? Con la camera? Lauren and I handed our camera to the fence. Hola. Here's what they shot. Gracias. <laughs> As the sun sets along the border in Campo, California, Border Patrol activity intensifies. The agents use a system known as cutting and tracking to detect and locate illegal border crossers. If you see a footprint, does that mean it's fairly, it's fairly new because there's constant traffic? This agent describes how footprints can lead to someone's apprehension. Um, if I can put my light down here. Yeah. That's, that's obviously fresh, and it's over the tire track of one of the agents that just came through this area. So you know he just came through here five minutes ago. You have a good indication of time on this crossing right here. You'll see the aliens will cross and they'll do a little brush out. 
or they have some styrofoam, uh, styrofoam shoes and they'll actually put them around and that's what they'll use to walk on. And when the border is like this, nice soft dirt, sometimes you can't even tell. Once someone is apprehended, they're taken here by the Border Patrol to be processed through IDENT, the biometric identification system, which records and files people's fingerprints and photos. Miles away, checkpoints are set up to catch people who have escaped earlier detection. How are you doing tonight, sir? Anything in the back here? Great, thank you. Generally speaking, what are you looking for? Uh, make eye contact with the drivers, look at their face, how they're reacting to the checkpoint. Who wants to check this one out? It's got a notch in the card. Every once in a while, they'll try to run a load through, and if there's a case that won't hold up in court, they'll end up getting turned loose, but they'll notch the card to let somebody else know that it, it's been a prior. Tracking, patrols, ground sensors, all these become much harder to deploy when you get to the wide open spaces further to the east. When we return, Nogales, Arizona, a notorious drug throughway, and the measures the government is taking to try and shut it down. We're at 500 feet above Arizona's mountainous terrain. Below is the town of Nogales, 65 miles south of Tucson. Richard Gorman is with the Drug Enforcement Agency. He says that only from the air can you understand just how dangerous and desolate this portion of the U.S.-Mexican border really is. There's a vast area that uh, is virtually, uh, uh, we're unable to, to patrol. Seventy percent of the drugs that are smuggled into the U.S. are brought across the southwest border. That makes drug interdiction a priority along these hard-to-patrol stretches. Nogales is known as a major drug throughway, not only because the terrain impedes patrols, but also because drainage tunnels offer drug smugglers and illegal crossers a pathway from Mexico to the United States. This is the Morley Tunnel. We wanted to shoot in the tunnels, but Border Patrol agent Greg Carupas warned us that they were highly contaminated. You don't want to go in there, believe me, you don't, because you never know what you'll take back. I've seen it glow at night. Yes, I'm not kidding, it's glow. We'll catch anywhere between probably um, 30 to 50 people coming out of these tunnels tonight. To understand how the tunnels thwart law enforcement, Sammy met up with the Mexican border police known as Grupo Beta. Well, uh, just put on a uh, bulletproof vest here. Apparently it's quite dangerous where we're going. These tunnels are dangerous because they're used by armed smugglers. I saw grim reminders of people who had risked their lives to come to the U.S. We came across a wallet which beta agents said was probably stolen by a bandit from someone attempting to cross. Seeing this picture made me wonder what had become of this family. The beta go to. Suddenly, the beta agents heard voices and ran after them. We came across this man huddled in the darkness. He told beta agents he paid a smuggler to take him to the United States, but instead, he had been robbed at knife point and left to fend for himself. I left the tunnels with a better understanding of the horrors awaiting those who dare to enter in search of a better life. While Sammy was in the tunnels with Grupo Beta, I was in Nogales, Arizona with Eddie, a narcotics agent. Eddie is watching a van he suspects is being used to smuggle narcotics. So tell me, why is this vehicle suspicious? What is it that you guys see in this blue van? In this van, uh, they've already confirmed that it does have a compartment or a trap door that they can load it from underneath the so storm drain. So you're basically drain. saying that there's somebody in the storm drain who's yeah. handing the marijuana through the bottom of the van. So it looks like nothing's happening with the van, but... On the outside, yeah. Look, I'll show you what they mean by storm drains, where the bundles are coming out. These storm drains are used by smugglers to sneak drugs into the U.S. This is the van that they had yesterday. They took the seats out, 
This is the hole that they were bringing the bundles in underneath. They had to have had somebody in here setting them up for it because there's no way they can reach from the storm drain through the hole, toss them over there, unless you were Michael Jordan, bounce it off the wall or something like that. Eddie showed me the marijuana confiscated from the van. These are the bundles that came out of that van yesterday. He points out how the drugs are packaged to slip easily through the narrow storm drains. It's easy money. You come across the border, pack, you pack a 40, 50 pound load, or carry it two, three miles to a car. That's a, that's a quick 500 bucks. You know, for somebody who lives in Mexico, $500 goes, they can make that stretch. Recent reports have criticized the Mexican government for not stopping drugs on their side of the border. But in Washington, there's a debate about whether sealing the border is the way to win the war on drugs. I don't think the way to beat the war or win in the war on drugs is to say you're going to try to seal the border. That's just impossible. The way to win the war on drugs is to stop the demand from this, in this country from continuing to grow so that way we can attack the supply that comes in. Clearly, I think we need even uh, more personnel, more additional resources than we have right now committed to the border. Seventy percent of all illegal drugs entering the United States comes across our southern border. And you just have to have a better border security if you're going to stop the drugs and if you're going to get a handle on the number of people coming in illegally as well. The whole issue of drugs, big issue, but please don't believe that the majority of the folks who are coming in without documents are, are mules carrying drugs. Most of them are not. Most of them are coming to work. We're seeing more family units, not just, you know, the, the papa coming over here to uh, earn money for, for mama and the babies back at home, but the whole unit. These families were caught coming out of the tunnels. They're going all over the place. They end up uh, uh, telling us where they're going. Uh, they said, well, South Carolina. What were you going to do in South Carolina? Well, I was going to go pick some uh, tobacco leaves. The illegal crossers were taken to a detention center where they were quickly processed. Being fingerprinted and photographed, however, does not seem to create much of a deterrent. Within an hour, they are loaded into a van and escorted back to Mexico. How many times can people come across in Arizona before they are prosecuted? Well, at this station, there is a threshold of between 10 and 15. Why so many times? Uh, if we prosecuted everybody for their illegal entry, which is against the law, the whole system, the jail, the housing of the aliens would be clogged up in one day within Tucson sector. As I watched a dozen men walk back over to Mexico, I wondered, would they try again? Well, we may see them in five minutes. We may never ever see him again. You never know. Why do Mexican migrants cross the border? In search of work. So does moving jobs south of the border, a result of the North American Free Trade Agreement, make a difference? We'll see how NAFTA has created new problems for customs and INS in places like Laredo, Texas, when we return. It had been two weeks since we began our journey along the American border. Our last stop was Laredo, Texas. 6,000 trucks a day cross from Mexico to the U.S. through Laredo, traffic fueled by the free trade treaty known as NAFTA. Increased traffic means increased problems. They're trying to bring the narcotics through, and we're trying to catch them. So, you know, it's basically a game that we're playing here. Gene Garza is the chief canine inspector at the Laredo port of entry. Hey. Settle down. And that's where it all starts. Officer gets here, picks up his dog, goes to work. So they're a very useful animal, a very useful tool that custom utilizes. It, it saves a lot of time for us. Here, find it. We cannot inspect every truck. The percentage of, of trucks that we inspect is, is, you know, only a small portion of the whole representative number that comes in. We've seen about a 30% increase in truck traffic, and we've seen that. Uh, uh, since NAFTA. The North American Free Trade Agreement reduced taxes and tariffs, making Mexico an attractive place for U.S. businesses to manufacture goods. But the new traffic generated by increased trade has created enormous pressures on the ports of entry. You can't have trucks 
hanging around for hours before they can cross the border. <laughs> Demetrius Papa Demetrio is with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington, D.C. You cannot have people who need to come and do their business in the United States either getting hassled or, for that matter, having to wait for a long time to cross the borders. Many companies exporting goods from Mexico to the U.S. face delays at the ports of entry. Gailey and Lord manufactures pants for designers like Ralph Lauren and Calvin Klein. This is just a plant that does all the little small parts on the pant. Uh, yes. Zippers and belt loops and what have you. Ron Pinkerton is the plant's executive vice president. NAFTA is good for our company. NAFTA is good for, I think, for the U.S. I mean, I've seen it work, and I've, I'm part of the process, and, and it's, it's working good. It's a lot of pen. Yes, it is. But the thousands of trucks bringing merchandise from Mexico into the United States cause problems for customs officials. Which ones are being used legitimately, and which ones are being used to smuggle drugs? Where are you finding drugs? In the trucks, we're finding it. We're finding uh, in gas tank. We're finding it in the in the cab area of the truck, in the roof of the trailer, on the sides of the trailer, on the floor of the trailer, in the in the in the tires. You know, I I, I don't want to say I've seen it all, but um, I think the probably the one that concerns me the most is when we see people that have the drugs in their stomach and they're trying to bring it through that way. This is the largest facility on the southern border for cargo processing. Leticia Maureen is the port director for U.S. Customs in Laredo. We have a, a, a facility here where we can get up on the catwalk and examine roofs of trailers. Inspectors were up here working a catwalk. They saw something wrong with the way the roof looks, so what they did was they used a drill. And uh, they went and they drilled it from the inside and, and uh, they found the cocaine. So it was a great seizure, 2,000 pounds. What we're looking at is almost 91 pounds of cocaine. This cocaine was found floating in the gas tank of yet another vehicle. A canine by the name of Rex inspected his vehicle and alerted to the gas tank. Uh, inspectors found about 90 and a half pounds of cocaine. What would you estimate the street worth of this? Is any idea? Uh, I think the value that was put on there was uh, in excess of $4 million. $4 million. That's a lot of money. Even trains are fair game for smugglers and border crossers. Well, I'm sure there's no illegal aliens. Agent Tom Lozano took us on a search of the Laredo train yard. Oh. Find somebody for me? Mm -hmm. yeah. See that door on the outside over there? Uh -huh. They'll go on the other ladder like this on the other side. I'll just climb up. Oh. Vehicles are assembled in Mexico, and the people could already be smuggled inside of the trailer. We're going to have four up on top. Smugglers have bolt cutters and whatnot, and they break the seals on the car carriers, and they'll load people in there for a certain amount of money. It's almost like the whole Wild West, where people used to track uh, Indians down, etc. We heard that there's a controversy in this small town of Rio Bravo, Texas. Is it not sufficient to park a Border Patrol vehicle here and maybe over at the end of the street instead of building this road along the river? Cindy Cano, an attorney for the Mexican-American Legal Defense and Education Fund, is concerned that the road is part of a larger plan to militarize the border. So you think that this is a militarization of the border? Oh, yeah. And, you know, like I said, I think it's very naive of them to say, oh, they're just here to build right now, when in fact they're building an infrastructure for future use. She told me about an army base camp being constructed nearby. It appears that they've built permanent barracks. They've built 10 helipads, which has caused a great amount of concern among a lot of the citizens here because 10 helipads seems to suggest that the military is going to be coming in with a lot more soldiers in the future. So the fear about the military working with Border Patrol uh -huh. is that the military comes in, they're not trained to deal with people coming across the border, <laughs> and so it can get dangerous. Right, right. And if there were to be, you know, any kind of covert patrolling out here, the residents wouldn't, they wouldn't know about it until some tragedy were to occur. We visited the Army base camp that Kano told us about to hear the military's side of the story. 
These soldiers are here to do a specific mission for us, and that's to upgrade and improve these roads. Border Patrol agent George Gano explained the need for better roads. By the time my agents get out here and get on these tracks, whatever we're following at that point, we don't know if it's illegal agents or narcotics, they're already a good 8 to 14 hours ahead of my agents. If you have these clean roads, these nice fence lines here, well, that gives us faster access to those tracks and those people. Come on, motor shoot, motor shoot. Those roads would normally be built in Haiti, Honduras, Bosnia, someplace else. Now the United States and the local citizens are getting to return all their tax dollars. So the military here is not working to patrol the border with Border Patrol. Just the fact that they are military coming to the border to do something, and automatically the red flag goes up and they say, oh, they're militarizing the border. When in fact we're not doing that. All we're doing is building the roads and that is it. But why then were 10 helipads being constructed? The helicopters are the ones from the Army or whoever's down here doing training, and that's, that's basically what this facility is for, as far as I know, it's just for more units to come down here and do training missions. Hey, first squad. While it's uncertain what the Army's long-term plans for the area are, some lifelong residents want the military on the border. Bud Natus is a cattle rancher. I'd like to see the Army stationed on the river all the time. I mean, we, we have the Army. What are we paying them for? To protect our country. Bud took me to the Rio Grande, which borders the edge of his property. It's not even knee deep here. Actually, right now, most of it you could walk across stepping on rocks and not even get your feet wet. There's some pretty fresh tracks here looking. They're not even dried. So would you, I mean, if they, if they said, can we uh, put up a fence on your property, would you, you let them? Yeah, I'd let them. Yeah. Let them build a big one. Uh, you want to ride? Sure. You ride pretty good? Um, it's been a while, but I'd love to come out with you. Yeah. This ranch is like any other business. It's the way we make our living. It's our livelihood. And when they come in and destroy it and still all of the stuff we have to use to make our living with it, it upsets you. The problem of illegal border crossings has gotten so bad that Bud is planning on leaving the area. Over the last four to six years, it's been getting, you know, progressively worse all the time, you know. And you finally just decided you couldn't take it anymore? Well, you know, it's time to move on sometimes. If this place sells, I won't have to put up with this anymore. What's it make you feel about be leaving all this? It makes me feel happy, relieved. I feel sorry for the people that still have to stay here and live on the river, though. Whether or not the government's future plans include a militarization of the border, one thing is clear. The battle in Washington over how to spend U.S. tax dollars rages on. When we come back, we'll take a closer look at the prospects for U.S. border policy in the future. Over the past four years, billions of dollars have been spent trying to control the southwest border. Citizenship. For three weeks, we journeyed there. We saw drugs being seized from vehicles. There's one. Witnessed Border Patrol agents capture and process illegal crossers. And watched as families risked everything to come to the U.S. I got a full boatload. But we wanted to know more about why the migrants were willing to take this risk. We sell ourselves as the best country in the world. So long as we're the best country in the world, there will be people who wish to come to our country one way or the other. Immigration from Mexico goes back over 100 years. And as with most immigration to the United States, it was immigration that we solicited. Come on over, we need help, whether it's in agriculture, in the low-wage services. And indeed, Mexicans came. And in the past 20 years, we have simply let it flower. Many migrants cross into the U.S. through Tijuana, a prosperous Mexican city just 20 miles south of San Diego. People are coming because they want to earn $10 in a day versus a dollar in a day. And that's not too difficult to do in this country to work, earn $10 in a day. There are unscrupulous folks in this country who are willing to hire people because they can pay them less. And as a result, they can make a profit. What we should not do is demonize. 
undocumented workers. In a lazy sort of a way, we move from open immigration to closing the doors, then back to open immigration, then closing the doors again. But were the INS's stepped-up efforts to slow illegal immigration being felt in Tijuana? Do you notice that people are still coming across? Or are they staying here more? Oh, it's okay. The, 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 the people is, uh, stay in Tijuana because can cross. Do people want to cross? Yes, they want to, but it's not as easy as it used to be. Many people from the interior of Mexico don't know about the buildup at the border. After being caught in the U.S. and released in Tijuana, many are penniless and wind up at places like this. Casa del Migrante is a mission for migrants in Tijuana, Mexico. We spoke to Father Fonsalato, who founded the shelter 11 years ago. We've provided food, help and care to more than 110,000 migrants since we began. Migrants come to Tijuana because it's the doorway to the first world. The men here envision the United States as the promised land. They believe that the streets in California are paved with gold. I need money. In the cross line is more money. The border patrol is tough right now. It's hard to get past the soldiers to the other side of the border. Roy Coyle is an American volunteer at Casa del Migrante. The Mexican migrant in the United States is dehumanized, and we need to give him back his humanity. These people do a lot for our country, and we should be thankful for them. And, and, and I'm not saying open the floodgates. I, I don't know what the answer is, but the answer is not what we have right now existing in the United States. Back in Washington, we asked the INS whether they considered their current border policy a success. Dr. Robert Bach is in charge of policy and planning for the INS. What we did is we stopped the illegal traffic, the chaos, the frontier justice that, that actually drove businesses away. We changed that and attracted people to live in the area, to move back and forth legally in a peaceful way, and to prosper. All we're trying to do is survive out here. Uh, cattle's getting out and stuff like that. Someone needs to answer for all that. Besides, uh, you know, who do you blame for all that? You, you don't blame illegal immigration. You, bought, you, you know, you blame that on Washington or your local, local people. Who do you blame that on? You know, it, it got like a war zone there for three years, literally, like a war zone. We actually looked at other places and said, you know, why should we abandon our property and our land and our country and walk away from a problem? instead of staying and fighting. That's what's wrong with the country. People don't fight for their rights or what they believe in. We decided to stand and fight, and we have. So the next one. I do not believe that three or four years or five years from now we'll be willing to spend $3 billion to have a border patrol that is going to be better equipped than practically any other army or armed forces anywhere else in the world. It is not really the best way to spend hundreds of millions of dollars. INS was funded for $3.8 billion for in fiscal year 1998, um, and they've asked for $4.2 billion for 1999. And so far, um, every year they've gotten exactly what they've asked for. Well, uh, I'm not going to say write a blank check, but within reason, uh, Congress can certainly do more. In this case, you're just talking about perhaps another one or two billion dollars to really get a firm uh, control on the border situation. There's no way you could stop them all. I mean, you just about have to hold hands up and down the river. Aliens can literally cross any place they want to. When I was growing up and, you know, working on ranches and living on ranches, the worst thing you could do would be turn in an alien. But now, the way I feel, I won't even give one a glass of water. We trusted them. We trusted them more than we trusted the local people. Because when we hired them, you know, they had honor and, and they'd take care of the place. But these that come across now, they're just, it's different. They're, they're completely different. They're always cutting our fences and, you know, bringing dope and stuff across. And then they come and they, they stole their pickup once and they stole the neighbor's horses. I believe it's gonna get lots worse. 
We haven't seen the worst yet. It's no easy task to leave your country, whether it's in Mexico or Poland or Thailand, and try to make a new home. It's even more difficult if you're trying to make that home and the host country has not accepted you because you haven't come in the right way. What is the primary reason do you find, based on your arrests and things, that people are crossing here? 98% of the people that we catch are genuinely good people that are just trying to sustain a life. The United States shouldn't provide everything for everybody. I think it should provide for people who are illegally here. Do you ever formulate relationships with these kids who hang out at the border all the time? Um, at one time this entire area would be full of vendors. You could buy tacos, uh, coconuts, really? coconut milk and all that through the fence. And uh, so you would get to know some of the people um, just because you'd see them every day and the change has been like night and day. I'm a man on both sides. I was born in this country where that, that I'm standing in and I live in the other country on the other side of that fence. Um, and uh, to me it's just uh, a travesty that this has to occur. It's, it's changed in the last couple of years. I mean, it was a much easier type of situation, much more relaxed. There's a, there's a tension here now. There was a lot of people who used to cross who don't come near the border anymore. The border is a joint endeavor. It joins two countries as much as it separates two countries. It is time for the Immigration Service now to be talking to people in the State Department, in the Commerce Department, and in the Treasury Department, and say collectively, what is the conversation that we might engage Mexico on about alternative ways to managing undocumented immigration?